much. It's great to be here and um, great to hear Lara talking about that fantastic campaign. Um, I'm here today to talk about um, a report and um, some research that my firm We Are Pi has recently conducted about society's changing rules. And um, I'm going to be trying to break it down um, in the next 30 minutes and cover a couple of topics which you know, have become the topics of the year, uh, very much so. But it's based on research that we conducted over the course of the last um, year or so, um, you know, going back to 2019. Uh, and covering um, a number of subjects uh, across five different themes. I'm specifically going to be talking today about um, relationships and how relationships and friendships are changing uh, in the digital age, but also across generations. Um, my name is Alex Bennett Grant, and I'm the founder and CEO of We Are Pi. Uh, we're an Amsterdam based ideas company based in uh, the city uh, that we're in today. And um, the New Society Rules um, is a, like I said, a report which has been conducted by our strategy and research team led by Mark Lester, Paris Bethel and Danny Marsh. And it's really about um, creating an ongoing platform of discussion with people at the forefront of cultural change. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video now, which uh, just gives you a sort of snapshot and understanding of, um, of NSR and what it's all about. And then I'm going to dive into some of our findings and um, cover some pretty interesting uh, and uh, provocative topics. So it wouldn't be a presentation during COVID times if we weren't talking about changing rules, resetting, uh, and cultural change. Um, so what I'm going to do today is try and deep dive a little bit further into some of the key topics which we think are actually creating the changes which are going to be longer lasting across the generations. Um, and so the genesis of this project really comes about from the sort of insight that we are living through the greatest period of cultural change since the 1960s. And this is an idea that we've been percolating for a couple of years now. And to a certain extent, it's been more of a sort of strategic insight uh, as opposed to a mainstream concept for the majority of our research period. But the fact that we launched our report uh, in April um, was a coincidence, but it was a lucky coincidence. And so an idea such as this at this stage is become a sort of universally understood comparison that we are living through what we looked back upon as a period of change as significant as the 1960s. And I think that th it's pretty easy to understand why that would be the case. You know, we're looking through societal change, cultural change, technological change, and the catalyst is very much um, driven by, of course, this year, a pandemic to disrupt our, our lives and the way of uh, acting and uh, living. But underneath the day-to-day -day fabric of modern life is the disruptive power of technology. And we talk about technology and disruption a lot in marketing with a lot of gusto, excitement and passion because it is where things are going, it is how things are changing. And that's very much true, but today's presentation is going to be more focused on the cultural and societal impacts of those changes and specifically the impact it has on our personal lives and relationships. So, when you think about a comparison between today and the 1960s, we sort of try to break it down across comparable, understandable um, examples. So the first and most significant example is the generation gap. Um, you know, we're always talking about generation gaps. Every new generation feels that their parents uh, understand and see the world differently than they do. But I feel like we can pretty much universally agree that the, sh the, 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 the gap that's widening between millennials and Gen Z and their parents and the value shift and the cultural changes that are happening are more significant today than they have been in the last 30 years. And the way people are acting on those value shifts are more significant and are going to create a bigger change than, say, my generation uh, would have achieved. Um, 
we can also see that when you talk about generation gaps, the language comparison is quite consistent with back in the 60s and 70s, the idea of a lost generation, uh, a generation that embraces counterculture, a generation that embraces uh, you know, different alternative lifestyles, a generation that supports uh, radical ideas such as uh, human rights movements, um, would, would be comparable to today's to generation who step out onto the streets uh, and embrace uh, social change through demonstrations, through participation uh, in the cultural moment, much more so than we've seen uh, in decades um, past. The other comparison we can look at is cultural philosophies. So what is the sort of default cultural philosophy that we carry around with us uh, when we are sort of interacting with our peers? Um, back in the 60s and 70s, there was a new concept which was bubbling up from sort of countercultural underground, which is the idea of being cool and things being cool, people being cool. And to be cool is a concept that it's almost impossible to remove from contemporary mindset. You know, the idea that you wouldn't be able to label something as cool or uncool, and the idea that others wouldn't understand what that meant about you or the subject matter is an impossible thing to uh, decouple from, from modern life. For many people, and increasingly the mainstream of younger generations, the idea of wokeness and being woke is the same equivalent of coolness. The difference is that it's based on a different set of values, fundamentally, you know, values of engagement, values of uh, context, values of um, being able to empathize and understand a broader cultural um, spectrum than um, maybe previous generations were asked to or em embraced to explore. So wokeness is the new cool. And to be able to understand that and think about back in this period of history in 20, 30 years from now, suddenly wokeness doesn't feel so small and insignificant and, um, and trendy. It in fact feels like a fundamental shift in the way we assess the world and measure the world. And then finally, of course, underneath it all is the disruptive power of technology. In the 60s and 70s, that was the power of TV beaming the world into our living rooms. That had a fundamental impact on the way we looked out into the world, the way we understood culture, the way we could see the changes that were going on in our countries across the world, whether it be civil rights beaming into our TVs or whether it be understanding different musical genres and, and cultures uh, beyond our doorstep. And of course, the internet has caused that to happen again. And now we are virtually living through the internet in a period of uh, a pandemic. Um, what we're seeing uh, overall is that as much as we're all trying to digest this information and we're all trying to strategize against it uh, as brands, as agencies, as a marketing world in general, and as individuals, um, when we look at it from a bigger picture perspective, we come to the conclusion that we're looking at a frustrated amount of misinformation. And this isn't about, uh, you know, um, scarring the, the news media with fake news. That's not what this is about at all. It's about recognizing that when you think about it from the broadest perspective, the 20, 30 year view, well, how will we look back on this period of history and how is the news media's capturing and um, you know, documenting of this period of history going to uh, last? And I think we believe that there's a general negative view about the cultural changes that are happening and a general negative view about the power of the internet and our lives. And we're here to have a sort of conversation about the balance uh, that's needed to understand what's really going on beneath the surface. Um, so, that sets me up for the point of view. This is not an objective talk. This is a subjective view. It's a provocatively optimistic report into where are the opportunities around uh, you know, cultural change for brands, for marketeers, for us all as individuals. Where is the light? Where is the positivity, uh, as Laura just uh, um, showed us through her great campaign? Uh, and how can we um, you know, bring that thinking into our day jobs uh, and into our lives in a more uh, constructive way? So the way we've gone about our reporting is very much about deep person-to-person -person research, face-to-face -face interviews, long Skype calls, spending hours and hours and hours speaking to people who are at the forefront of cultural change. Because for us, that's the only way you're going to get the nuanced understanding of what's really happening uh, for the communities, for the scenes, for the conversations that are happening at the front, you know, at the real edges of uh, the cultural changes we're seeing. So we've spoken to a great spectrum of people from across the world about different scenes which are making the difference. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that today. So 
the, the report we publish in April covers five different themes. I've chosen specifically to talk today about one of them, which is called Relationships 2.0. And as you can see from the name of the title, it's a positively optimistic view on how relationships are changing. It's about relationship upgrades because of the power of technology and the internet. It's not about how relationships are being fractured by the same technology. Those two things are all true, but we've chosen to focus on the thing that we really need to hear, which is how are things things changing and how can we participate in it uh, and support it. So this is about how friendships, romance and identity are changing in the digital age. Um, this slide has no value today uh, because it's the most universally understood thing, uh, but it's a good grounding point for thinking about how we have evolved as a society, as a race over the last few years. You know, we are really living our lives in relationship online. I'm doing it today, beaming out to the world, or at least an audience. Um, and we're all participating in this slow transition, uh, which has been accelerated over the last few months. But what I really want to talk about today is friendships and relationships and intimacy, OK, and communities, which is much more than just Zoom calls and uh, video gaming on the superficial level. It's about getting deeper into how these things are changing our lives and the differences between online versus virtual, physical and offline. I'm going to cover a couple of topics such as online dating, gaming, virtual hangouts, vir uh, VR spaces, and safe spaces on the internet, which uh, you know, do, do still exist and are still a vital part of our evolution as a society. Um, I think it's pretty easy to understand that there is still a significant amount of stigma around digital life and about embracing digital relationships and virtual relationships, especially when it gets into the nuances of actual friendships and actual romance. Um, we've all seen examples of news reports talking about how we've got a generation who have been uh, destroyed by smartphones uh, and the addictions. And of course, that's not untrue. There has been a significant rise in, um, in problems, arise, you know, mental health issues arising from the overuse of technology. However, there is also a lot of light um, that comes through when we look at that a lot deeper. So I think that you know, at this stage, when we have no option but to move forward, it's time to embrace digital relationships, and it's time to understand what's going on at the forefront. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we found in our research, um, speaking to different people. The first and most important thing is the idea that fully fledged online relationships, so relationships built online, are real. And they're as real as any other friendship, and they're as valuable and uh, can be as intimate and nourishing and additive to one's life as any other relationship. And so if we think about the power of social media and the way that people are using uh, spaces like gaming, we have to recognize that the changes that are going on in those spaces are rapid, and the significance of the way that people are adopting those technologies and those spaces is far more than you would see on the superficial level. People are really changing their lifestyles. And 67% of Generation Z believe that they wouldn't have the same types of relationship and they would be more isolated if they couldn't connect online. And of course, that is uh, unquestionable today. If you look at this research data that we collected from a conversation with Scott Valdez, who's the founder of Viva Slept, you can see that there's some really interesting shifts going on. The number one place couples in the US meet has become online. And so if you think about that, that's the first stop for new relationships. And research has also found that online couples and relationships are longer lasting. So I'm going to come on to talk a little bit about the sort of intensity and the, uh, you know, the, the shift in behavior needed to navigate online relationships versus offline ones. But just to think that it's the number one destination for new relationships is an interesting way to understand the world today. There's a great stat here that sort of talks about how it's not only relationships and dating, such as the use of Tinder, uh, the famous uh, and much loathed and you know, it's a demonized uh, dating app, but it's also the much loathed and demonized gaming platforms and the way in which people come to those platforms for uh, you know, connection and competition. Uh, but you know, of course, there's side effects, there's trolling issues, there's addiction issues. But this story here from a conversation we had with Charles Powell, who lives in New Jersey, a 28-year-old guy, said that 15 years of playing on Xbox Live, which is the online version of video gaming, the first time he ever met the guy who became his groomsman was at the wedding. That's why he believes that online friends are real-life friends. So if we just think about the 
the, 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 the significance of that example where a guy and another, you know, a couple of guys who met on the internet playing video games, spent you know, a number of years connecting, getting closer, sharing intimate parts of their lives through the playing of a game. And then it was only when he reached one of the most important milestones in his life that he decided to bring that relationship offline so they could physically share the moment of his wedding. And it just goes to show that all of the meaning, all of the connection that went on up until that point was just as real, just as meaningful as the moment they stepped offline and enjoyed a special, special wedding day. So just thinking about online first as a relationship starting point, online depth in terms of uh, people having real connections before they bring it offline as being a significant shift. And so we have to recognize that gaming is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, hangout space in the world at the moment. And for everybody who's not using gaming on a regular basis or is it of a different generation, the concept of gaming, aside from you know, all the hype we hear in marketing, is still quite abstract, I think, for many people. But I'm here to say that, really, gaming spaces are providing one of the biggest concerts of 2020 was held in a video game with Travis Scott performing. Uh, one of the most important and significant political, um, you know, political moments, political events of the year uh, happened in Twitch in a gaming environment uh, as part of the democratic election process. So we really are seeing these becoming fundamental first steps for real experience and real connection. And it doesn't, the example I gave about the Xbox Live uh, gaming relationship and how it came offline um, is mirrored in this example here about seeing how people are using the virtual space for the most important milestones in their lives. This example here of somebody using a video game to invite somebody to a prom. You know, it, for the, all the non-Americans out there, of which I'm one, the idea that you would take that sort of coming of age moment, that sort of significant milestone in your life, and use a virtual space to, to invite somebody is, is almost unheard of uh, if you look at things from the physical perspective. But these are the types of experience that are happening online and the way in which the physical and virtual are merging. Um, but the truth is that digital stigma is still holding us back. And again, there's lots of reasons why that's perfectly reasonable to, uh, to happen. Um, but there are limitations when we, when we get too sucked into digital stigma. Because as we've seen in the last few years, romance has very much embraced and been embraced as an acceptable um, you know, part of your life to explore online. You know, it's a very private part of our lives uh, to find love, to find new relationships for romantic reasons. And so that's become a mainstream concept. But what we're now seeing is that those same environments, those same dating app environments, such as Tinder, such as Bumble, are expanding out into full-blown friendship spaces. So they're not just about dating and hooking up culture. They really are about finding new relationships outside of your core friendship group. And so there's this great quote from Christina Baptista, who's one of the first Bumble BFF users, which is the friendship side of the Bumble app, who talks about how people want to believe that meeting in person is the natural way to start relationships. Well, we all act and think in that way of a certain generation. Um, but if you reverse that and recognize that you know, physical is not the natural way, it is just the default way for certain people. And if you flip that around and think, OK, what else is out there? What opportunities are there for us? Then it really changes your perspective. Digital life is opening up relationship pools. And so that is a really positive output and result of uh, moving on to the digital world. We weren't all born in a big city with a big friendship group with friends that we want to keep for life. Some of us were born in small towns. Some of us still are searching for our people. Uh, and so the idea that friendships can be formed in the digital space without the limitations of the physical world is a really great addition to our lives. And we're seeing this in the stats. You know, Tinder is not the number one place for hookups. That's still the real world. You know, there was hookup culture before there was Tinder, despite what we'd like to think. In fact, Tinder and platforms like it are actually becoming the destination for finding new relationships and expanding social horizons. You know, it's often about the adventure uh, and less only about the uh, romance these days. Um, and we can also see that, you know, it's expanding the type of people we meet. And there's nothing negative about having a more diverse friendship group. You know, again, we're all brought up in certain micro environments and we can't always be traveling. And so the idea that we can use the internet to have more diverse groups of friends with different references can only be a good thing. 
It's also raising the bar of relationships, though, because you know, with digitization becomes different metrics that people use to measure the types of people they want to meet and see. It's not only about the energy in the room. It's not only about that chance coincidence. It's about a lot more stats. And so recognizing that and figuring out how to navigate that is a big part of how people are successfully um, using online spaces to build their relationships. And so we spoke to Scott Valdez, as I mentioned before, and Scott's quite a polarized character in the online dating space because he's really embraced the idea that he's going to consult people on curating their online profiles to be more successful in the dating world. So almost taking over people's uh, profiles and giving them tips on how they can be more efficient and effective in the online space. That's not something that many of us really like the concept of if we have a traditionally romantic view on relationships. Um, but, you know, Scott tells us the truth is that if you're an inch taller, a year older than someone, then instantly you get weeded out. And so none of us want to be weeded out and none of us like the idea of efficiency when it comes to relationships. So we need to figure out the new rules and the new codes of success uh, in our future lives. Um, and this drive for efficiency in the dating Scott believes was inevitable. You know, again, we all like to think that it's not something that we would embrace, but let's be honest, as soon as you step into a world where you can measure stats, you take that with you all the way through your life, including your personal life. And so figuring out how to navigate is the big next step for all of us across relationships and dating. Uh, the next example I'm going to talk to you about is social media. Now, social media has been getting a bad rap for many good reasons over the last few years. The algorithms are out of control. Our democracies are crumbling. And so it's easy to overlook some of the fundamental um, building blocks which social media has contributed to in expanding people's worlds and enabling people to find their people across the Internet. And so we spoke to people about how um, they're breaking free from uh, the confines of you know, regular life and finding uh, their identity very much so more on the internet as opposed to being seen as more fake on the internet. So this is a great quote from Jamie Wanderlust, who is a, a non-binary model, a writer, and a speaker. And we spoke to him about how he's managed to expand his horizons through the internet. He talks about how he rarely actually receives online abuse. And if he does, it's quite short-lived, uh, and it's not the bigger experience. The bigger experience, in contrast, is getting uh, his makeup, the makeup on and presenting in a feminine way and the reaction being 99% negative. And so if we think about how his physical and digital worlds, uh, you know, as he explores um, spectrum is, 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 is merging and he's actually getting a lot of benefit from that space. This quote is also beautiful because they talk about you know, the best messages they got from a dad whose both of the children were non-binary and the dad was learning about the non-binary experience, and Jamie's contribution to that discussion was enabling that father to have a closer relationship with his kids. And so bridging the relationship gap across generations is a big contribution. And the final example I'm going to give is um, from Nafisa Barka, who is the founder of Amelia. And that is an online platform for uh, Muslim women who are exploring beyond their horizons. And the interesting thing about this story is that she really comes to this from the perspective of not having a massive Muslim friendship group. And so, you know, when we think about minorities in different communities and how people come to the world, we often think that people have their, you know, their, their core communities and they're expanding out beyond that. But sometimes people are also still trying to find their core communities, such as this example. So growing up, I didn't, I rarely had many Muslim friends. I was always searching for sisterhood. And she talks a lot about how, you know, post 9-11, the identity as a Muslim and a woman was quite a complex thing to unravel. And she was always searching for a better understanding of how to be a modern woman and how to be a modern Muslim woman as well. Um, and so she goes into the details about how, how by creating this community online, she's able to help people explore different types of, pe different types of connection and perspective across uh, the female and Muslim world that are not, you know, they're not um, myopic. They are much broader and diverse types of experiences that people are having uh, and that they're able to learn from each other across different cultures that they all live in. And so to close, I just want to say a couple of things about how these examples can be used for brands to think about how they approach communication, how they approach approach engagement with consumers uh, in this virtual world we're all living. The questions come in the form of, does your digital marketing strategy, strategy have a virtual product strategy? So, you know, th this distinction between digital 
and virtual is becoming increasingly important for brands to navigate and understand the world they're playing in. In what ways can your brand help break the stigma of virtual relationships? So there is still a very big stigma around virtual relationships, especially relationships that start in the virtual space. How can we start to help people navigate that world, especially as we're all forced to embrace virtual life in a way that we never anticipated? How could you support people's important virtual life milestones? I love the examples of you know, the wedding, uh, you know, video gaming for years before becoming a best man, or um, you know, inviting someone to the prom via, uh, via, via shoot 'em up. You know, these, these are such abstract concepts for many, but what they represent is real life milestones. How can we support people who are exploring ways to do that differently? And finally, how can you encourage and help others to find their people online? That is still a very big necessity for people who aren't necessarily finding their identity and their space and would feel much more comfortable and confident to discover new communities online. That's the core benefit of platforms like uh, social media, and we should get back to thinking about how we can support those. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, very inspiring speech as well. Um, I, I just wanted to start on the relationship side of things. It's, it's funny when you talk about people finding that it's not as, as real when people meet online, but actually it does two things which we've always done. You know, you kind of went through this closely. You know, the serendipity of meeting on a train or in a bar, that's not a conscious thing. I mean, that why not just meet on an Xbox platform with someone that you're randomly paired up to? That's no worse per se, yeah. and the idea about randomness plus trying to find your people there, it seems to be something that social media is really well done for. Um, how, you know, as, you know, with, if that's, you know, if, if brands are trying to reach people in that way, you know, things become quickly much more, they rise to the top than they have in the past as well, too. Mm -hmm. So in, a, in an era where there's no underground everymore, where everything quickly rises to the top, how do brands walk that line between trying to be current and trying to be, you know, authentic? I think that um, the, there's two sides to the coin in a way, and it's, it's, it, t today is a very, um, unique period in history to have this conversation, right? Because you know everything I shared today is is sort of from the perspective of the life that we all are forced to live. Um, it's just the question of how deep are we going, and how deep as a society are we embracing this change? And so, and I think that that goes the same with brands. So there's there's always a lot of opportunities uh, to superficially explore ways to uh, entertain or ways to connect with people in the digital and virtual space. Um, it can be um, a, you know, a secondary consideration. Um, and and there's, there's value in that, right? Because there's value in experimenting to figure out how best a brand can find its role in the virtual space. But I think what uh, the research shows us is that there are real opportunities to have a more deep and meaningful contribution to people's uh, lives. And so if I take the, the prom example, you know, being invited to the prom via video game, like you're talking about a concept which is universal in, in a certain culture. Uh, you're talking about romance. You're talking about you know uh, a coming of age. You're not talking about uh, which gun you're carrying. You're not talking about you know which competition you're in. And so I think that if brands can start to understand that, in regards to what category they're in, they can contribute to people's real life milestones, even you know from FMCG all the way across to tech. Um, and these spaces are just environments where people are spending time. Then I think they'll have a much easier time recognizing a, a distinct role, you know, uh, as opposed to thinking purely about, you know, short-term experiments. Interesting. Uh, you talk about the differences in generations. Uh, there's a question here from the chat. Um, do you think that generational cliches found in the digital space, such as OK Boomer, uh, that meme are actually exasperating generational gaps? Yeah, I mean, of course. Uh, I mean, yes and no. I mean, in the end of the day, everything's a meme. Anything that sort of um, has a little bit of insight around it is, a, you know, becomes meme, becomes popular culture. And so, the conversations, you know, like "Oh, Dad," you know, which would have happened before or have many iterations, are just being memeified and turned into. So, of course, we can look at how that pulls generations apart. But fundamentally, you know, younger generations, older generations, are always going to have a, t a, a, a tension. The difference, I think, is that the amount of change that's going on now is going to, in the long term, have a fundamental impact on the broad society. So it's not so much about these little examples you know, that you could see in every generation. It's more about looking at this moment and thinking, my God, this is 1968. 
And so, yeah, sure, there's a little bit of OK Boomer, OK War Veteran type of conversation, <laughs> but it's really about a bigger change that we're seeing. But like in 1968, though, I mean, the counterculture was a counterculture. I mean, now, you know, brands are a part of that conversation as well. Uh, you know, what, what ramifications will that happen? Which is there, I mean, it's, and look at this year, things you never would have thought a, uh, brands would, would get close to are now, you know, front and center. Is yeah. that for real? Is that going to stay? I think that it's going to be a really, it's going to be very interesting to see how marketing is judged uh, in one or two years from now. You know, the, the work that we're seeing coming out uh, during this period, both the quality of the marketing in terms of uh, how well it's been produced, but also the quality of the thinking that goes into it. And I think that, you know, we can look back and recognize that in the 50s and 60s, the blueprint for modern marketing was created, right? Uh, during that time, that time of, you know, American boom, uh, post-war. And so, you know, a lot of the tactics that we use today are pretty much still the same tactics, you know, buying billboards, running TV ads, uh, trying to emotionally connect with people. Um, I think that what we're going to see over the next few years is, like you say, these sort of brands experimenting with their actual voice. You know, not the voice that they were given because an agency told them this is your voice, but their actual voice. Right. And it will fail miserably because it's, it's probably a little bit more reactive. And it, or it will rise, you know, to the top. And, you know, some brands are doing that, such as the likes of Nike, successfully. And they'll also get vilified for doing it. You know, let's not get, get it wrong. But that's what happens when you speak up in any public forum. But, so, but let's talk about the vilification, too. So con consumers, they want authenticity. They want them to be involved and support their, their views. But they're also quick. You know, we talk about cancel culture. And they can also be quite unforgiving with mistakes. Mm -hmm. how, how does a brand supposed to balance that out? I think a, a brand needs to, um, yeah, I mean, it needs to exercise its voice uh, or it needs to shut up. You know, that's also an acceptable way to join in a discussion. If you haven't got anything to say, then don't say anything at all. I speak a lot, uh, you know, and I'm known for it. Um, I've got friends and colleagues who are, in you know, introverted and don't speak as much. They have just as much to add. Uh, to the conversation by not speaking as they do from speaking. And I think brands will try, let slowly start to figure out which environments, which forums are they best to speak up and which environments and forums are they best not to speak up and, and leave it to those who actually have a relevant point of view. I find that interesting. The, the, in, the focus on the introvert, you know, we talk about, you know, gender and race and stuff much more, but that, that focus on uh, hearing the introverts has been one of the unexpected sort of interesting trends I've found over the last years. You know, just like you said, they have people, they have things to say as well. Um, here, question about the virtual space. Um, for a lot of brands, uh, it's a big investment in the tech and the data to make it work. Um, you know, how, what would your advice be to small brands? I mean, we can't all be Travis Scott, uh, you know, with McDonald's Happy Meals and, you know, in Fortnite. You know, how, how, how can a small brand make an impact in this new digital space? I feel like, in a way, uh, smaller brands have the advantage of being able to, um, you know, focus their investment in places where other brands aren't looking. You know, and so I, I don't think if you take gaming, for example, of course, undeniably, it is a, you know, a race for, you know, ownership or control of those spaces, sponsorship of those spaces. But we also see some really unexpected examples of smaller brands uh, building a lot of community love by doing things right and doing things with meaning and purpose. Uh, and a lot of the bigger brands trying to come in and sort of like uh, own, for example, the e-gaming space and completely getting rejected and yeah. having no impact at all. So I think that it's, you know, it's about speaking to the people at the core of those communities, working with them. It's about uh, supporting existing initiatives. It's about supporting existing needs uh, and trying to, um, you know, contribute something. Uh, you can't you can't put a banner on everything, you know? And I think that that's the frustration reality that brands are having to come to terms with. Oh God, we're gonna actually have to go deep on this one in order to get the value exchange in return. But might it be a little bit of the same problem that's happening in like retail in big cities where, you know, we have empty storefronts because, you know, New York wants to have a, a, a bank in the corner and they don't want to have a small pop-up gallery. You know, is there something like that in the digital space as well, where they have these dreams, we've got these, you know, we've got this audience, it's so valuable, we want to have, you know, McDonald's money, but actually we need a bit more, you know, a bit more of a creative brand down here, yeah. which doesn't have, you know, it's about landlords, you know, wanting maybe lower rents in order to get the creativity. Is, is there something there? I, th I mean, I think that you know, we're going to see, I'm, I'm always interested to see what happens in the physical world and, 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 and how it's going to change over the next year. So I moved to Amsterdam in 2007. Uh, by 2011 is when I started a business, and that was pretty much the core 
of the crisis back then. You know, it took a few years for Amsterdam to sort of feel that pain. And when it did, you know, the whole city was empty. And we had empty, you know, uh, pop-up spaces all over the place. Yeah. And I think that it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next 12 months when, you know, what is the economic impact going to be? And how is that physical, virtual, uh, you know, uh, you know um, real estate balance going to work? You know, it takes a lot to throw a virtual event and, uh, and attract an audience right. a lot. You know, we're here physically trying to... But let's be honest, one of the reasons we're here probably is that the rent uh, is different in 2020 yeah. than it was in 2019. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. it's no, maybe so a perfect example. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's going to be really interesting how brands start to try and navigate, OK, where's the, where, where can we add value? What's going to happen in the physical spaces that become empty as everyone's locked in their homes? Uh, what's, how are we going to actually attract attention? To, you know, people are getting online fatigue, I certainly am myself. Um, and, you know, where, where are the opportunities in between those two spaces? Last time, quick question. Um, does the online world and the new trends that you talk about, they could also bring generations closer together. I mean, parents are closer to their kids in music, much closer than I was to my parents' music, for instance. You know, me and my son talk about the same things. So is it going to bring us closer together or separate us farther apart into little silos of age and groups? Well, I think, I think that's a good example. So, you know, there are different parts of popular culture that tell us different signals. So the example you gave of, you know, Spotify and music uh, tastes, well, you know, the algorithm says that you two shall be together. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the algorithm also says that you two shall be very apart on different uh, social and uh, economic topics. So I think that... Um, we are going to see, there are great examples of people coming together, such as the one I gave of, you know, a dad learning from Jamie about how to navigate something as unfamiliar as a non-binary identity um, and, you know, the language around that you know, the, and how to approach it uh, and how not to just simply reject it. I think that, you know, we are seeing great examples of people wanting to learn uh, the new rules so that they can participate in cultural change. It's, the generational shift is not such as you're old so you don't count and we're moving on. The generational shift is there's a fundamental shift in values and it's just about whether you want to participate in how things are changing. Okay, we'll end it there. Alex, thank you very much.